In the vaults of our hearts and brains, danger waits. All the chambers are not lovely, light, and high. There are holes in the floor of the mind like those in a medieval dungeon floor. The stinking oubliettes named for forgetting, bottle-shaped cells in solid rock with the trapdoor in the top. Nothing escapes from them quietly to ease us. A quake, some betrayal by our safeguards, and sparks of memory fire the noxious gases. Things trapped for years fly free, ready to explode in pain and drive us to dangerous behavior. Those are the words of Thomas Harris in the novel Hannibal, and this is The Red Pen. Welcome to episode two of The Red Pen, where we cut up fiction to see what it's made of. I'm your host, Amanda Jean. And I'm your other host, Austin Chant. And this one is my episode. Episode one was Austin's, and I got to it's be It's your the, time. Yeah, I get to take the reins. Buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> Since it's you, I know it's going to be a wild one. It's a wild one, especially because, as you can tell from the quote, I am taking you to the series by Thomas Harris, all about Hannibal Lecter and his evil machinations and, you know, cannibalism. Hell yeah. I was just gonna say, do you think there's anybody who knows your particular brand who doesn't know how you feel about Hannibal Lecter? There's gotta be an outlier somewhere. There's gotta be a Spiders. Is it Georg or Georg or George? Spiders George? This I could not tell you. I don't actually know. I I feel like it's Spiders Georg. There is a Spiders Georg. So no, I don't think that there's anybody who's moderately familiar with me who isn't aware that I stan (laughs) Hannibal Lecter and have since I was a wee child too young to be seeing the movies and reading the books. And that is a great segue to talk a little bit about how I got into the Lecter series and why I'm talking about it in this episode. I was probably 11 when I saw um, a version of Silence of the Lambs, the movie that had been recorded off of Lifetime Television for Women, (laughs) which was a very interesting way to imbibe that piece of media. (laughs) (laughs) heavily edited yeah what did they do with it so you know the scene with migs where he hisses something vile at clarice uh yes he says i can smell your scent in the lifetime version and that bit where he definitely does something even grosser to her is completely cut so you just sort of see him in his cell being weird and then clarice is horrified and then lector screaming for her to come back and it's like what what what? He's mad because Miggs was hissing some more? <laughs> <laughs> There's a line that Lecter has about Clarice and Crawford where he's like, do you think he visualizes exchanges, scenarios? And the line in the movie is fucking you, but they dubbed it oh. and it's like not quite matching. So it's like, do you think he visualizes scenarios, exchanges, fondling you? And it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's real good. And yet it still managed to capture my very, even at the time, um, true crime obsessed mind. And I bought the VHS or a friend gave it to me and then I bought the book and then I read Silence and Red Dragon and saw the original adaptation of Red Dragon which came out in the 80s directed by Michael Mann called Manhunter and boy is that a ride one day one day I'll have a second episode on Lecter stuff and it's just going to be all about adaptation and how that can go wrong and right I was hoping you were say just one episode all about Manhunter I mean, I could do that. I could do an episode per each of my episodes is like, welcome back. (laughs) In this episode, we're going to be talking about why they spelled Lecter with a C-K-T-O-R. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about the films or the the TV adaptation. I'm here to talk strictly about the four books. Uh, There's Red Dragon, the first one, not chronologically, but the first one published, then Silence of the Lambs, then Hannibal, and then Hannibal Rising, which is a prequel that Thomas Harris wrote last, and I'll get back into that. Everybody that I've ever encountered has at least a small amount of cultural knowledge about Hannibal Lecter as an antagonist and as a pop culture icon. (laughs) 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 You know, he's up there. He's up there with Beyonce. Like, those first namers share Beyonce, Hannibal. (laughs) Yeah. In those four books, two of them are really good, right? Red Dragon and Son of the Lambs are excellent books start to finish though they have their flaws those are the only two i've read which you know what good 
I think you you sent you sent me all of them when I started getting into Hannibal, but then you were explicitly like, yeah, you know, you don't have to read the other ones. I mean, you can. It is an option, but I feel like unless you're as obsessed with um, Hannibal Lecter as I was in 1999, 2000, you really don't need to put your eyeballs on them. I'll be talking about why a series with four books has two that knocked it out of the park and two that arguably did not. And I say that really enjoying Hannibal as a book and tolerating Hannibal Rising as a piece of art. We're going to start with Red Dragon because it is the first one. And that one, if you don't know, is about an FBI profiler named Will Graham, who is sort of in retirement. He had a really bad experience actually catching Dr. Hannibal Lecter and being eviscerated by him a little. He's got a lot of trauma stuff's going on and he's trying to live his little life uh, with fixing boat mo- motors with his uh, with his his newfound family. And Jack Crawford from the FBI, the head of the behavioral sciences unit, comes out and is like, hey, there's this new serial killer who's doing a lot of nasty shit. His nickname's the Tooth Fairy. Can you please come help us solve this because you have an uncanny ability to relate to serial killers and that's why you caught Lecter. And Graham's like, absolutely fucking not. He was trying to practice self-care and Jack Crawford was like, no, not on my watch. In the course of the book, he does actually try to go after the Tooth Fairy and he ends up going to Hannibal Lecter for help. Um, I'm going to spoil a lot of these uh, books just because they've been out for so long and I I honestly consider them part of the public domain, which is not true, factually. Also, they're not like mysteries yeah. like having read two of them they're they're not books where like they rely heavily on like oh you don't know who the killer is it's like you know exactly who the killer is exactly it's more about how you're gonna catch them you even follow them some of the time if i recall like there's a lot more suspense just coming from like are they gonna kill that minor character they're friends with and then things went really badly for will and it ends with him he doesn't die <laughs> <laughs> All right. He gets stabbed in the face and he loses his family because at that point, Molly was just like, yo, your shitty job put us in immense amount of danger. And now you just got horrifically traumatized and disfigured. Uh, and so it basically ends with Will being like, anyway, I'm in the hospital and everything's bad. And that's the end of Red Dragon. And in um, Silence, we're introduced to Icon of the Century, Clarice Starling, who's an FBI trainee, who is also sent by Jack Crawford to gain Lecter's help in tracking down a serial killer named Buffalo Bill. And eh, it's not really pertinent what he was doing, but he was a nasty fuck, too. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some really, um, this is a note, I guess, a, a content warning if you haven't already read these books or seen these films. There's some really gross stuff in regards to, I don't want to call it trans rep, because it ain't. Uh, it's even, it, the fascinating thing about it is it's explicitly not trans rep. Yeah, and it's um, said. But it's explicitly not trans rep in a way that is in itself shitty. There's a bit where they're like, we want to be clear. Buffalo Bill is not transgender. Transgender people are just like pathetic and harmless. Yeah, they're too, they're too passive they're just for sad, this. They're just sad and broken. This man is a serial killer <laughs> who just looks exactly like one, I guess, what our horrible idea of a trans person is. So it's like, it's like, hey, Thomas Harris, thank, thank you. But also, fuck you. Stop. Stop it. (laughs) I love you, Thomas, but fuck you for that one. There's a couple of fuck you for that ones in this episode. I'm also sorry I'm taking so long to break down these plots, but I really am setting up what each book was about. Set the scene, Amanda. Where things fucking went left. Oh, and I should say, I also don't trust your average viewer of the movie Silence of the Lambs, let alone, you know, a reader, to remember that they say that James Gunn Buffalo Bill was not actually transsexual, that he was just fucked up and he wants to be. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like, like that just maybe no one's that's remembering maybe a level that. of nuance that particularly when that book and film came out was not there it was not there in the discourse discourse. (laughs) yeah actually uh heavily protested by trans and lgbt groups for shitty representation in the studio and i believe thomas were like but it's not he's not though and it's like yeah (laughs) you tried Um, you made an effort give me a gold star and a rubber mallet to apply it with the plot of silence of the lambs is clarice trying to hunt down buffalo bill who is killing and maiming women in a really gross way it's kind of a quest story because she's a trainee she's 
She's young and scrappy, and she's pretty hard to shake, despite all of the bullfuckery that comes at her from so many angles. And one of the major themes of the book, and God bless Thomas Harris, because you could tell he was trying to know but didn't know, is that patriarchy bad and sexism wrong. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which is all true, all accurate. And Clarice Starling is a feminist hero. And she was actually a huge part of why enrollment of women at the FBI went up, why there are more women in that particular realm and in law enforcement. Um, she was a huge catalyst for that. So like, yay, that's cool if you're into that. It's pretty heavy handed. Everybody's nasty. And sometimes that's fine and true and checks out with a lot of women and femme presenting people's experience of the patriarchy and and the shitty sexist world we live in. But when you're combining it also with the murder and torment and just gross things happening to women, it gets a little much. But all that said, Clarice Starling is a a hell of a main character, and you learn so much about her and how she functions as a woman. And she's definitely a prototype for that, like, very smart and kind of reductively tough lady in law enforcement. Dana Scully from X-Files is shades of Clarice Starling, and pretty much every woman that you encounter in um, later crime films and, and media is an echo of Clarice Starling in some way. Red Dragon and Sons of the Lambs were written in the 80s and were therefore trope originators. They weren't following established patterns of what we would now consider tropes, like seeking out a killer to catch a killer, like the genius tortured detective is a little too close to his, <laughs> the people he's trying to catch, like the just like Boy, you thing. Boy, were we going to go down a lot of rabbit holes on that one. <laughs> It was just, Hannibal Lecter also was a side character. He was a foil. He was a mentor. He wasn't the main antagonist. That was left up to Francis Dollarhide, a.k.a. the Tooth Fairy and Red Dragon, and also Buffalo Bill, a.k.a. Jim Gum in um, Silence of the Lambs. So he was just this weird dude who was in prison who'd already been caught. And we were learning things about him, like the fact that he was a fucking cannibal and his name's Hannibal, and that's ridiculous. A surgeon who became a, a therapist and that he was wily and you don't want him in your head. Also, this is a great time to mention that I don't, uh, Austin, I don't know how much of this you remember, but as if to make Lecter that much more special and othered, he had maroon eyes. Oh, God, I forgot that. Where's the quote? Because it's really bad. How? In what way are they maroon? Um, let me find this quote for you right now. What just... part of them is maroon? Dr. Lecter's eyes are maroon and they reflect the lights in pinpoints of red. Sometimes the points of light seem to fly like sparks to the center. His eyes held starling whole. Okay. (laughs) He has red fucking eyes. Maroon eyes. Thomas Harris gazing in the mirror. (laughs) His beautiful eyes like points of light flying across the room like little bats. It's even funnier because Thomas Harris is at this point now an older, kindly southern gentleman. Aww. Last I saw a picture of him, he has like a beard and he's a little chubby and he just looks so, he looks like a small Santa a little, like a mall Santa author who lives in Florida with his wife. He's just a pleasant old man who used to work, he worked the crime beat for Associated Press and that's why he became, you know, probably (laughs) uncomfortably fixated with death and murder. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So not only does Lecter have maroon fucking eyes, his name's Hannibal the Cannibal Lecter, he's He's very oh, special. He's a genius. He also has a rare form of polydactylism where he has a... Okay. Yeah. He has a duplicated middle finger on one of his hands. So he has six perfect fingers on one hand. and that becomes Six perfect fingers. Perfect. Because he was shaped by the hand of Michelangelo. He also is described as sleek and small. He, uh, small white teeth, um, slick back hair with a widow's peak. His voice has a metallic rasp. And so all of those things are in Red Dragon and Silence in varying degrees. So you get the idea that Lecter is a very unnerving, othered figure between the cannibalism and the mind games. And that's all actually pretty cool because there weren't a lot of characters like that. Like there are a lot of arch uh, villains in fiction and they're usually like Moriarty types. And Hannibal is a Moriarty figure, but he also has glowing maroon eyes and a six finger. <laughs> it is it is fun because there's an element that, that I think I really enjoyed in those books of just sort of over the top, almost fantastical yes. villainy. It's present with all the villains, but then you have Hannibal as this sort of the arch villain, the villain's villain. Everything about him is just like made for evil. 
Oh, uh, also Lecter and Will, to a lesser extent, have photographic memories. That's cool. Hannibal is very much a dairy character in Red Dragon and Silence. He's used to ratchet up tension. He's used very effectively. POV is third omni, but it kind of floats in Red Dragon between Will and Francis Dollar Hyde and a couple other people. And in Silence between James Gum and Clary Starling and a couple other people. And both of these books are similar in that they are both psychological thrillers. They both have a heavy element of procedural in them and they both are really similar in genre even though will graham is a much different protagonist than clarice starling they serve a very similar role though they have different endings clarice does not end up stabbed in the face and drinking in uh florida (laughs) as will does so those are the first two and they're great books and i highly recommend them and you know manhunter came out and then silence of the lambs the movie came out with jodie foster and anthony hopkins and it really saturated the culture and remains iconic to this day and i think built the mythos of hannibal lecter and our enjoyment of hannibal lecter as a character like we kind of root for him and then uh okay so we're gonna talk next about the other books in this series which into the unknown we're gonna we're gonna go some places this is an area where austin has not dipped his toe he only is pretty familiar with you didn't even watch season three of hannibal did you the tv show uh i watched most of it oh yeah that's right and then you peaced out for good reason (laughs) hannibal which was a a book set i don't know 10 years after lector's escape from custody and he is pretty much a, the second pov character in the book which is the first major departure the fact that hannibal is a main character and is a pov character and in hannibal's scenes of his perspective he's living it up in um, florence he's taken over he's killed and replaced the uh, curator of a museum and his <laughs> you want to know what his um assumed name is um tom bombadil <laughs> <laughs> that would be better. What? Okay, I'm very curious. His name this is. is an... <laughs> His name is Doctor Fell. F E L L. Really, really, Hannibal. Yeah, Hannibal. Listen, for all that we have elevated him to a status of the ultimate villain, he's just he lives for the drama. He's ridiculous. He writes people petty letters, and I wish that we would, as a culture, acknowledge that more. Because one, even though I I absolutely uh, love this character and am clearly interested in crime fiction and stuff like that, I don't think it's maybe the best idea to talk about serial killers, even fictional ones, like they're superheroes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think maybe that's a bad idea. Hannibal the novel, half Clarice's POV, roughly, and half Hannibal's POV, roughly. And Hannibal's POV is like this weird, gothic, self-indulgent id fulfillment, and you learn so much more about Hannibal than you ever needed to know. We go through like his flashbacks to his childhood. We learn about his memory palace, which at the time was a fairly underutilized convention. The idea of having a memory palace you could visit where you could relive or catalog um, experiences in your life and sort of disappear into like a a meditative or dissociated state inside your head. That became more well known throughout the years. And you may have recognized it if you watched BBC Sherlock. Sherlock has a memory palace. Well, Hannibal in Hannibal definitely had a memory palace. And I don't hate it. Like I will say, I don't hate that Hannibal has a memory palace. I think that someone of his intellect and weirdness would. Let's just keep piling on these extra abilities. This is Thomas Harris's very special man. (laughs) (laughs) He's very, very smart and he's very cultured. My name is uh, Ebony Darkness Dementia Hannibal Lecter. His, his, His eyes are maroon and they have lights in them. Little lights. And also he can go to his memory palace whenever he wants. He can do cool stuff there. He can play the harpsichord in there. And he knows how to play the harpsichord. And he probably knows how to play ten violins at once. And one with his sixth (laughs) finger. Yeah. Just by itself. Oh, his special, his six perfect fingers can each play a different perfect (laughs) instrument. He's a whole symphony by himself. He, uh, as a plot point in Hannibal, between Silence and Hannibal, he did have his sixth digit removed so that he would be less easily identifiable. He also, I think, had some sort of rhinoplasty. Okay. Wait, no, I'm stuck on this. Did he have his hands smallened the rest of the way to close the gap? Or did he just go around and be like, I never had this sixth finger, pay no attention to my stump. I feel- 
very good question because when I looked up pictures of this type of polydactyly, I was not, I, I don't think it would be super duper easy to just like remove it. I really don't think that it would have just been like cut, done. I mean, no. It seems like a pretty thorough. If you get, if you get a finger cut off, you don't just, your hand doesn't just sort of reabsorb it <laughs> as if it never was. That's another one of his powers. <laughs> okay, well. Hannibal's special and the normal rules don't apply to him, clearly. It's true. So Hannibal uh, is is somehow evading capture as the world's most pretentious museum curator. Um, And his storyline is basically uh, wandering around Florence being ridiculous. But he's also kind of evading another one of the plots, which is one of his former victims who lived, this dude named Mason Verger, who's a piece of shit. Mason was a sadist and gross and very rich and powerful and molested a lot of children and abused his younger sister, Margot. And Hannibal... And he was like put into court ordered therapy and Hannibal was a therapist. And in the course of their therapy, Hannibal was like, what if I drug him and convince him that it's cool if he cuts off his own face? And then that's what happened. And and Mason's like living a very disabled life uh, and with his not insubstantial money and resources is sending is collecting information on Hannibal Lecter on what is the equivalent of the deep web. <laughs> and, you know, he he's basically tracking this dude down and guess what he oh, guess what he wants to do to Hannibal Austin. I'm trying to figure out if like having watched the show gives me any sort of insight. It might, but like this. just think about But I see I'm just trying to remember what happens on the show and that's a non starter. Uh, <laughs> cut his face off. I mean, no, but, like, you're not too far. Cut his butt off. (laughs) Just get, like, a nice... See how he likes it. See how he likes having no butt. Eat him. Kind of. You're you're on the right track. Eat his ass. (laughs) No, but I'm sure that exists in a fan fiction somewhere. It's unfortunate. Um, Uh, Yes. You're close. I'll, I'll I'll hold I'll hold you back because if you haven't gotten on it now, you never will. He decides that he wants to have these like special. Have him eat his own ass. <laughs> Hannibal <laughs> like that? Are you it? kidding? Hannibal would yeah. fucking nom he's nom nasty. nom chef's kiss. So he decides that he's going to get these special like wild boars that have been meticulously trained to attack and savage screaming humans. And he's going to have Hannibal Lecter eaten from the feet up by wild boars slowly over the over like days if he can. That's his plan. It's a good plan, I guess. (laughs) Not weird at all. Yeah, I I mean, (laughs) that's one way. I guess if you're a disgusting sadist who has nothing to do but lay around in bed all day thinking about revenge, you would eventually come on the wild boars eat your arch nemesis thing. But I'd just be like, can we just shoot him? (laughs) Isn't that enough? So that's his thing. And in his machinations, he has managed to snag this Italian inspector, like this Italian detective who is looking for Lecter. Can I just say, I feel like much in the way that Thomas Harris has failed to actually like exclude trans people from his narratives <laughs> um, i feel like he's also failed to exclude like normal sadists <laughs> from his narrative he just can't he can't take a thing and not run with it in the worst direction hey i'm not even gonna get into the weird shit he do he did with margo a victim of abuse who's also a lesbian there's cool stuff mm. there and by cool i mean mm. oh don't look at it or think about it Like I said, I would argue that Verger as, I don't know if I want to call him a killer, as a villain is somehow worse than the dragon and, well, the tooth fairy and Buffalo Bill. Mason Verger, who's like rich and powerful and able to keep harming children Mm -hmm. i don't know why that is they're like there's an there's a there's a slick of grossness on this book that isn't in my mind to the same level in red dragon and silence the lamps that's my personal very subjective opinion yours may vary so while all this is going on guess what's happening to poor clarice starling the hero of silence of the lamps she's having a really nice time yeah, she's got her spa days. People are waiting on her hand and foot. She has a great like, job. Clarice, you're so smart. You're so good and so t- just good at your job. You're an excellent shoot shot shoot. <laughs> you're an excellent, excellent shoot. shoot. And everything's going well for you. No, the patriarchy is worse. It's back. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> we thought we kicked it, but it came back. The patriarchy is so bad in this book. It is mostly exemplified by this dude named Paul Krenler, who once hit on her in his oozy way, and she told him to go back home to his wife. And he, like, has never forgotten that and constantly is, like, trying to unnerve her and fuck over her career. And she actually ends up in this huge snafu in, in, in terms of, like, a public shootout in the beginning of the book. That's less important, but what you kind of need to know is that Clarice has a job she doesn't really like in the FBI. She isn't super well respected by having caught Jam Gum at, before her official career even started. She's been sort of blacklisted. She can't advance her career. Men are disgusting. And as sort of like a, a sad, I don't know, last ditch effort to get her out of the way, they put her back on the Lecter case and they have her basically in a basement of, of FBI, like surrounded by weird Lecter memorabilia, just trying to find that dude. And because Clarice is good at her job, she actually starts to make really good headway. She figures out that Hannibal's um, Achilles heel is honestly his taste and his arrogance. And she realizes that if she researches like, this is a really rare wine that he liked. Who sells it in Europe? This is a uh, this is the type of car that he liked. Let's put out flags for people who buy these cars. Like every over the top rarity she can find, she goes after. Um, he sends her a letter because I think he finds out that she's after him. And it smells good. Like the letter smells good. And she's like, this motherfucker probably got like a perfume or a lotion special made. And he did. And that's how oh she God. finds videotape footage of him in Florence at a per perfumery or whatever, having this like custom, custom lotion or perfume, I can't remember which, made for her. He's just the most punchable man. Right? This is the book where I feel like everybody's long held opinion of Hannibal Lecter as like very smart, very sophisticated is sort of um the wind is taken out of their sails. There's a part in Hannibal where when he comes back to the I just remembered this and I'm I'm taking us here. So there's a part in Hannibal where he comes back to the US and he stalks Clarice as she's jogging and he breaks into her car and he licks the steering wheel. <gasps> Hannibal. He's a super cool dude, guys, and we should all Hannibal model you're our playing scene. yourself <laughs> here. You don't know where that's been. He really doesn't. She, he probably licked it and was like, she had McDonald's last week. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is what you get, Hannibal. I hope she used hand sanitizer right before then and it got all over your stupid tongue. The two separate halves of this book are Clarice trying to find Hannibal, Hannibal living it up in Florence and trying to avoid Mason Verger and his henchmen, including this Italian detective, and then going back to the U.S. to sort of cat and mouse with Clarice some more. And eventually, as Clarice's horrible professional life continues to collapse around her in smoking ruins, she and Hannibal kind of meet up and then Hannibal gets kidnapped by the Vergers and he almost gets eaten by boars, but Clarice saves him. And it's actually pretty oh. cool. She's a badass. Um, and then I think Clarice gets shot. And then the ending of the novel is essentially a really long sequence where Hannibal and Clarice like hang out while she's super drugged. And he definitely does this weird thing where he makes her talk to her dead father. And I hey. think f went and found her dead father's bones. <laughs> Again, super Hannibal. <laughs> great therapy, great psychic driving just consents everywhere and then at the very end um they kill paul krenler eat his brain and then they run away and live in europe together as a couple that's cool excuse me yeah that's the end of hannibal the book excuse me yeah that's it clary starling and hannibal lecter end up together excuse in europe me? <laughs> clarice Clarice, I thought we had an understanding <laughs> about this guy. Because that was Jodie Foster's reaction where she read that and she was like, I'm not doing this shit. <laughs> like, no. You and me, Jodie. And they rewrote the, this is again for another episode, but they rewrote the script for the movie Hannibal to like change the ending. <laughs> and she was like, still no. <laughs> wanna, I don't want to, I don't want to do this movie about Clarice being slowly degraded by a a system that realistically undervalues her and victimizes her and then like Hannibal. Eh. But yeah, and it's never really sure. Like he does this thing and I'm not sure if I can explain this super well. <laughs> he does this thing where in her brainwashing, he like, has her set up to be unbrainwashed or unhypnotized by a particular sound. Um, and I think it's a note. And every time he hears that sound or will hear that sound in the future, he's going to like look at her to see if she like wakes up. And I'm like, Hannibal, what the fuck? <laughs> Hannibal. One. This isn't, this is not how we are. I'm just imagining like that happening in an elevator in Spain. <laughs> Four yeah. years later, she hears that note suspended and it is like, Whoa. one, why am I blonde right now? This is fucked up. Two, 
Why am I wearing like something pretentious? Yeah, why am I wearing something pretentious? Three, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> here's the thing nobody in 2000 except for me wanted them to end up together and me and a hardcore contingent of <laughs> hannibal clarice shippers who definitely had a corner of the internet where we were all making playlists about their love and writing filthy fan fiction about it yeah we all wanted that but i don't think mainstream audiences were like yeah you know the hero of sons of lambs this like badass feminist icon clarice starling who went you know and matched wits with lecter and came out relatively unscathed and like saved the day what if we just illustrate that it's really shitty for women in any sort of law enforcement and that she can't escape this like kooky serial killing cannibal who's definitely gonna drug her and then Austin, the things that happen in this book are so fucking awful, bad, ridiculous. There's a part, oh boy, there's a part where she, she post her drugging conversion, uh, she's sitting there talking to Hannibal and she's just like, were you breastfed? <laughs> Normal conversation oh, if I've ever man. heard one. And he says, yes. And she's like, hey, so the sister that we find out that you have in this book, was she breastfed? Yes. Do, were you ever jealous that she was breastfed and you weren't and he's like i don't remember but i don't think so i loved my sister and she says some other shit and then in a scene in a moment in an image i haven't forgotten in 20 years almost puts some fucking expensive wine on her nipple and is like hey. come get this or whatever <laughs> I feel like this is why, like, one of the things that people undervalue about fandom is the thing is the, is the thing that you can have your ship and never have to know what the actual creators would do with your ship. Because I guarantee you it's not as good. Because in most situations, you don't want them to, really. No, I didn't want lovely, kindly, older man Thomas Harris to have Clarice put wine on her nipple. No. And talk about breastfeeding while she's drugged. Uh -uh. I didn't want no, that. Uh -uh. No, like, people are all like, I want my ship to be canon. And I'm like, do you? <laughs> do you? <laughs> Looks directly into the camera. You want? you want the wine nipple thing? Points. <laughs> So that's the end of Hannibal. And okay, backtracking to talk a little bit about why Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs were so good. Maybe uh, Hannibal wasn't as good because we moved him into a main character position, gave him a POV, switched genres into some weird gothic bullshit, and kind of had thematic whiplash because we're working between Clarice's vaguely procedural, I guess, perspective and like Mason Verger fucking shit up. No one wants stuff from Mason Verger. And there's not even like an interesting other serial killer to fill that gap. They kind of tried. There's like some serial killer, the, the Italian detectives chasing, but I can't even remember that dude's name. It's this very strange installment in the series that while it has some interesting points, just does some wackadoodle stuff and has a Stockholmy end ending and it's just kind of yucky and I don't think that it really uh, deserves its predecessors. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, I say that again, still enjoying it. So I have some great news. We have our first ever sponsor this week. Woo! Oh, man. What the, <laughs> what the fuck was that? Listen, I made the most enthusiastic sound I could because I'm so excited to be sponsored by Criminal Records Podcast. It's a new true crime podcast, and it covers some of uh, history's weirdest true crime cases, and I thought it was kind of a nice compliment to the crime aspect of this episode. The hosts are historian Isaac Mayer and storyteller Demetrius Benrad, and they cover all of the fun crimes, from heresy to sodomy to imposture, witchcraft, licentiousness, high treason, and using the U.S. Postal Service to send obscene materials. I mean, doesn't everybody use the U.S. Postal Service to do that, though? Speak for yourself, I Amanda. I'm a pure-hearted soul. <laughs> you haven't seen my Christmas cards. <laughs> Why didn't um, I so get not one? Only, what? Why didn't I get one? Because I didn't send any this year. Okay. <laughs> sure. But in general, I mean in general, look out for my Christmas cards. They are definitely obscene and sent via the U.S. Postal Service. I'm on a watch list now, I'm sure. Yep. So I really like this podcast. I've been listening to it since it came out, and I was super psyched that Demetria and Isaac wanted to sponsor this episode. So it comes with my personal recommendation. It isn't just like a rando rang our doorbell and was like take this money and talk about our 
tree farm, which we would do completely. 100%. Yeah, if you do own a tree farm and you would like us to talk about it, you can pay us to talk about just about anything. Yeah, your in book, fact, you don't your Etsy store don't really have to pay us usually, but for this, <laughs> they did, and we're glad. This is a great. <laughs> Listen, we've been waiting to do this for, let's be real, all of our lives. Yeah. And also the last two, two, almost three years. We're very excited about this. this is what happens. (laughs) (laughs) We try and be like, listen to this really rad podcast that was nice enough to sponsor us. They're really fucking cool. They're both smarty pants. And it's like weird as hell. The shit that goes down in these episodes, um, everybody's fascinating. Everybody's unique. And one of the things that the podcast tries to do is find the sorts of people who don't normally make history books. And it's pretty international, so it's not just American stories or Western stories. And as a sort of teaser, they're doing their first um, queer history episode this month in January. And it's about Willem Arondius, I think is how you pronounce Willem Arondius. Willem's name. I don't know. I just thought I'd say it with I don't know. Right? And I don't even know who that is, but I'm excited because queer history and kooky true crime stuff i'm all about it the teaser here says that they were a total badass so look forward to that yeah i'm super psyched i'm actually really excited for that one to come out because as i said i actually listened to it not that that would matter i'm cheap (laughs) (laughs) this one just gets like an extra stamp of approval (laughs) (laughs) but yes thank you so much to the criminal records podcast and you can find a link to the criminal records podcast in our show notes but it's also at criminalrecords.libsyn.com. That's criminalrecords.libsyn.com. And then we're going to get to the final book in this series, which is also the prequel, is Caught Hannibal Rising, and it's bad. Can I just say, title-wise, I would allow... uh, I would allow uh, Red Dragon's good. Silence of the Lambs, very good. Yes. Hannibal. Fine. Okay. Lazy. Hannibal Rising, laziest. Hannibal Origins. <laughs> Hannibal Odyssey. <laughs> Hannibal Syndicate. <laughs> Hannibal Black Flag. Hannibal Unity. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Hannibal Rising, which is another huge genre leap from... Red Dragon, Sons of the Lambs, and even Hannibal, arguably. For backstory on this, this is where Amanda's going to have a little bit more leeway for poor Thomas Harris, the kindly old Southern gentleman that he is. And I'm just going to say he didn't want to write this book. He very specifically was like, no, I'm done. I'm done. I wrote my three books and maybe I have regrets. Um, (laughs) We don't know. (laughs) That could just be my projection. I just, I, I don't know. He was done. So this company, the De Laurentiis Company, had the rights to, I think I think MGM still had silence, but De Laurentiis Company had the rights to produce more Hannibal stuff if they wanted to. And they wanted a prequel because why sit on the origin story of Hannibal Lecter if you think it can make you money, right? And Dino De Laurentiis said to Thomas Harris, if you don't do the prequel, this is a direct quote, I will do it with someone else. I don't want to lose this franchise and the audience wants it. He said, no, I'm sorry. And I said, I will do it with somebody else. And then he said, let me think about it. I will come up with an idea. So this poor Mm. old man who's been done with the series, which I'm sure he loves with all of his heart because he's, you know, he wrote the damn thing and he spent years on each book meticulously researching everything. Um, And then they're like, hey, write us a prequel. Write us the Batman Begins of Hannibal <laughs> Lecter. Hey, would you please write us a bad book? Would you please just, like, write us the Star Wars prequels? Like, please just do that for me now. Not with your years of uh, lead that I that you usually have on your books. Just, like, sit down and write it. So he wrote the book, and he also wrote the screenplay with which the movie uh, was adapted to. So Hannibal Rising developed some of the things we learn in Hannibal, right? Like, we learn that Hannibal had a sister, and that she was killed. And you learn in Hannibal that, I think you learn in Hannibal that he unwittingly ate her because of reasons. And I think you do also learn in Hannibal that it was because Nazis. In Hannibal, yeah, yeah. So in Hannibal Rising, we learn that Hannibal Lecter is the son of a Lithuanian count who lived in like a castle. And he had this younger sister named Misha, this baby sister named Misha, who he loved dearly. And he was a very odd child. Very beginning of the book is just like, here's Hannibal being a little kid who's kind of smart. 
cool. And then like the Nazis come and everything's bad. Literally everything's bad. His whole family is killed. Nothing's good except for he and Misha. And they're kind of trapped in this barn and, you know, forced to watch. It's like a, in the winter in Lithuania too. And there's no supplies. And they, they escape to their little hunting cabin or whatever. And that's where the Nazis come and get them. And then essentially what happens is Misha falls sick and they eat Misha. And Hannibal unwittingly or unknowingly eats her, uh, which I imagine would be deeply traumatic if you ate the sister that you loved. And the rest of the book is just Hannibal. Like, it's a Bildungsroman story. Like, he's a little kid and then he's like a young man and then he's traumatized in the orphanage that has taken over his childhood castle. He's so traumatized, he's mute for a really long time. And uh, then he eventually escapes. I don't know. He goes somewhere to meet up with his aunt and uncle. His uncle is dying. And his aunt is, um, his uncle married a Japanese woman named Lady Murasaki. And she sort of takes Hannibal under her wing and helps rehabilitate him a little um, and teaches him a lot. In fact, I think that actually is a cool element of the story, like Hannibal having an interesting, mostly benevolent figure who was femme, who taught him how to be a human <laughs> i am stuck on her being lady marissa yeah we're not going to talk about that we're also not going to talk about the fact that i believe ooh, at, i believe at one point she and her assistant make cranes for their cousin sadako okay so did he <laughs> thomas <laughs> listen he didn't want to write this book and it shows <laughs> I can't, okay, yeah, no, I, I buy that. Was he just going through, like, okay, I need a placeholder name. Mirasagi. They're not going to stop me, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, my editors aren't going to make me change this right, like, no one cares. Okay, cool. So eventually the story is about how he goes to medical school young and basically how he becomes a young man and then eventually seeks vengeance upon the Nazis who ate his sister and made him eat his sister. And he hunts them down pretty much one by one and kills them and eat some of them. It's essentially a revenge story. And as he racks up these kills, and he also kills a very rude butcher who is crude to Murasaki, he comes under suspicion by uh, an inspector who used to prosecute war criminals from wor World War II. So this dude has got like an idea of, you know, if you're going to catch a monstrous vibe from somebody. And Murasaki's like trying to protect him and also trying to be like, okay, hey, this is consuming your life. And they have this weird courtly love affair and it's strange. And then eventually he he goes too far. He kills all the Nazis. He's probably, oh yeah, he's eating some shit. Like he's just eating people. Cool. And uh, then pretty much Murasaki disowns him and like goes away. Like that's basically the book. And you don't see the bridge between Hannibal consumed by the idea of revenge and Hannibal who he ends up being in even Red Dragon, which is this mm, sadist who likes to play mind games and apparently eats people just because they're rude. I think there's a big world of a difference between somebody who's seeking revenge for the ghastly murder of their sister and maybe trauma has also propelled them into cannibalism. Yeah, I'm not seeing the link. Yeah, like I, like I get that like obviously time passes and maybe he gets more of a taste who taste for it but there's not we want the making of a murderer if you're invested in if you're so invested in the Hannibal Lecter character that you're going to read and or watch Hannibal Rising you kind of want to see him along the path to the man who he will become later because that's what we like right like, we like the guy in the cage I'm super smart and I'm gonna make you feel bad and I'm a cannibal and I have maroon eyes and it's just not there. Hannibal Rising is a is a, a strange meandering in some places novel that basically just tells us, hey, this this dude was super duper traumatized and then he ended up a serial killer. And that's like kind of it. There's not as hmm. much exploration of the otherness of him. In fact, I don't think there's any mention of his polydactyly in that in that book. I don't remember them even mentioning if he had maroon eyes. Here's the thing. Thomas Harris is a very thorough author. I can't see that he wouldn't have checked his notes or gone back and read his books to make sure he had all the salient details. And also, how do you forget the maroon eyes? How could you possibly forget? Them? I won't forget. I never will again. I see them in my head right now. They're going to watch me while I fucking sleep. I, it's just like, would you do a Bildungsroman of Satan? Because <laughs> that is who Hannibal is. Yep. Yep. In the in the rest of the stories, he's the devil. Yeah. He's not 
He's portrayed like on a level of like villainy, but also borderline telepathy and he's barely human and malevolence that he is not he's not really human. He is like a malevolent spirit. (laughs) And then if you take that character and go like, what if um, though Satan had sort of like a rough childhood and then there were some really bad people in his life and he got revenge on them and you're like, okay, and then the, the Satan part. Yeah, like, when does that happen? I'm waiting for the Satan part to kick in. I don't want to feel (laughs) bad for Satan. (laughs) That happened later. Don't worry about it. There's a line in Sands of the Lambs that directly contradicts the whole existence of Hannibal Rising and the Misha backstory and all of that. And I get that it's from Hannibal, so it could just be what he's trying to project to the world, because Lord knows that man cares about his image. But he says, nothing happened to me, Officer Starling. I happened. You can't reduce me to a set of influences. And boy, is that more interesting than Nazis ate my sister. Mm -hmm. I care so much more about this like barely human personification of the devil who is dangerous to even speak to and is so over the top that his name's Hannibal the fucking cannibal. I care so much more about that as like a romp and an arch villain than I do like the sad boy, the sad special boy who sought revenge on Nazis and, you know, maybe went too far. And it brings to mind... You know, there's the old adage that you never show the monster. I think that that is the primary fault of Hannibal Rising and a secondary fault of the novel Hannibal because we do get some of this backstory in that book. It's not as in-depth, but we do understand like something happened to him in childhood. He has flashbacks to it. He can't really contain that part of himself. It's deeply distressing to him, his sister, blah, blah, blah. The more we show an audience elements of a monster, the less room they have in their own brain to fill in the blanks with what makes them scary. And also, I mean, I mentioned the Star Wars prequels. There's a Patton Oswalt bit from one of his earlier albums, and the bit is called At Midnight, I Will Kill George Lucas with a Shovel. <laughs> Essentially, he he's talking about, and I won't fucking recount the whole bit as me. That's cool. I won't do that. But uh, he essentially is saying, if you pitch these things to me, it's like, you get to see Darth Vader as a little kid. It's like, oh, cool. Is he like killing people with his mind? No, he's a little boy and his mom goes away and he's very sad. Okay. And it's like, you also get to meet Boba Fett. Oh, cool. Boba Fett, badass bounty hunter. Yeah, he's a little boy and he loses his dad and he's very sad. And his point is, I don't need to know about where the things I love come from. I just love the things that I love. And I think that there's a huge element of that that is the reason why Hannibal Rising falls apart as a book. Arguably why Hannibal does too, because we spent so much time in this dude's POV that all of the veil between us and him is pretty much ripped away and we get to see him lick a steering wheel. Like, it's just not (laughs) cool anymore. And I talked to my friend Ibba about this because she is also a, a, a lector nerd from years back. And she said, you know, I think it's partially because Lecter became such a pop culture thing. He became a phenomenon. He is seen as sort of like she compared it to Anne Rice sexifying um, vampires with Lestat and Louis and shit. And in some ways, Hannibal Lecter sexified, if not <laughs> serial killers and cannibals, then then at least villains. Mm-hmm. And they made them, in- he made them intriguing and beloved and just like campy and ridiculous. And you don't really want to go and push things so far that no one can like him anymore. The reaction is to actually do the thing of humanizing him, of giving him a background that he, I don't think, needs. I don't think we needed to know everything that we learned about him. As Harris wrote these books and built more and more elements to the the backstory of Lecter and the mythos of Lecter and just kept throwing like he threw he basically built the Winchester mystery house like wh- every time you thought he was done he'd add a fucking room or a ladder or a <laughs> basement like he'd just add something and he'd be like oh I thought I was done oh wait the memory palace or like oh wait you know he he's good. the wine nipple scene like it was never over there was always one more place that Thomas Harris could take it to there's also something I thought was interesting in that I think for people who have written series like if you spend a long time with a character you learn more about them and things that you thought were true in your original iteration of them aren't or they they just don't play out through time and one of those things in Red Dragon that's mentioned is that he's not classified as anything like some people call him a sociopath some people call him a, a psychopath or a statist or you know you know, serial killer cannibal, he he defies categorization because he doesn't have enough of the signifiers to be comfortably in either one, which is another sign of his othering. But 
Graham says he had the worst sign of sociopathy, and that's uh, cruelty to animals as a child. And that never comes up in Silence, Hannibal, Hannibal Rising. In fact, you see Hannibal being relatively cool with animals. Like, you don't see anything cruel. And I think this is one of those cases where Red Dragon was nascent enough in the characterization of Hannibal Lecter that this ended up not being true. And I think if, for a lot of us, if I found out that Hannibal was sadistic to animals rather than humans. I think that would be a hard note for me. I think I would mm-hmm. like him way less. So that is the uh, the general summary of these very different first two books and last two books. Now I'm going to say a couple of things about how this might apply to people who write series or people who revisit characters later down the line. And some of them are really big gimmies, like don't let someone force you to write something you don't want to write because it'll come out. Yeah, maybe trust your instincts on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Like, maybe don't. Maybe just don't, though. Maybe just let it live in the people's imagination. and Or honestly, let, in this case, let the De Laurentiis company make a shitty prequel. And just yeah. disavow it and be like, hey, I didn't write that. That's fine. Do what you will. Like, I don't think it could have been that much worse than Hannibal Rising. <laughs> I don't want it. It sucks. And these are all subjective and there are exceptions and examples of, I'm sure, other series doing this wonderfully. But my biggest takeaway was the abrupt shift of genres between Silence and Hannibal. So we went from, like I said, this very dark psychological thriller, true crime procedural to uh, a gothic Rom also split that with Clarice's bureaucra- bureaucratic bullshit and career ills. And it's like whiplash in that book. It's whiplash in the series and it's whiplash in that book. So if you're going to change or develop genres within a series, you might want to not do that so abruptly, I feel like. Or you have to be prepared that you're going to alienate some readers. My other advice is don't show us the monster, or at least don't show us the monster in such excruciating detail. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's such a classic piece of advice, but I feel like people take it to assume, like, if it's a movie monster. Yeah, no, it's not just a creature it. feature thing. It, obviously, the less we see of the Cloverfield monster is probably for the better because things are scarier if we can fill in the blanks, like I said. It's also true of things that are scary on a more personal or psychological level you know it doesn't just have to be like a tentacle reaching out of the darkness or like jaws it can be someone's motivation it can be someone's backstory it can be their pov which again may have been a mistake (laughs) may have been a mistake to write half a book in lector's pov just saying don't let the mythos behind your character become more important than the character itself. And I think that that is something that most authors would know already. Don't let audiences' reactions to your characters dictate how you write them. But it's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Like, if, you, if you're writing a book and, you know, like, some character who's secondary becomes the fan favorite and everyone wants to know more about, well, I mean, I like this character. Sometimes it's better to let them fill in the blanks on their own. Because if you write something and it's extremely divisive, you could, ri- you could risk tarnishing people's experience of that first book. You could risk people really not liking subsequent books in a series. See, I'm not saying don't write sequels or don't write the same character. Just be very careful of your motivations for doing so. Because you're at a certain point writing to audience specification. And that's yeah. not a great thing. Even worse, if you do it, someday people on a podcast might make fun of you. They might make fun of you a lot, and they might have 20 years of this just boiling in the back of their brain, just like ready (laughs) to explode. The injustice of Amanda's youth, mainly concentrated around what did Thomas Harris do? (laughs) Why did he do Clarice Starling so dirty? Why did he try and humanize Hannibal Lecter? These are the questions I have. Um, Also, poor Will Graham, but whatever, I care more about Clarice being brainwashed than I do Will Graham being stabbed in the face. So these are two things that came up in my conversation with Ibbo, bless her. So she mentioned that uh, a similarity is in the Arthur Conan Doyle uh, Sherlock Holmes stories. Frequently, he was not the POV character for most of the earlier stories. He became a POV character later. And one of the reasons I think that was done, um, in part because I think he folded to how popular Holmes was, one of the reasons that was done is because people seem smarter when you're you're not in their POV. Yes, I was actually going to hop in here and say that Agatha Christie does that so much because I've been reading nonstop Agatha Christie this year. She does that a lot with both Miss Marple and Poirot. There are multiple like Poirot books that I've read where he just kind of pops in and is like, by the way, I solved it. (laughs) 
Well, you were but busy. <laughs> I don't think he's... I have not read any where he's the POV character. And with Miss Marple as well, there's literally one that I read where she shows up three quarters of the way through the book. They're like, we need a murder consultant. Can we just like ask Miss Marple to come over from the next village? And she's like, oh, yeah, no, OK, I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have the sort of the presence and the aura of the genius detective. But you acknowledge that that's not really what the story is about. That character may be beloved. They their personality, their inner world is not as interesting as the story itself. And the effect and the they have on it. Involved. Yeah. Yeah. That's why Lecter worked in Red Dragon and Silence, because he was the character who had answers and could show up on the scene. And, you know, his his role in Red Dragon and in Silence was to be a shit stirrer, but also to basically drop hints to how they could solve things. He actually tries to help Clarice find Buffalo Bill. He actually knows who he is. In Red Dragon, he has a better idea of what the dragon's motivation is what he's doing and how to catch him and that's why will's there that's why clarice is there and to take him out of that context and give him a fuller role and say not only are we not having him track down or or aid or foil somebody he's a main character and we have to live in his pov and see how special he is and isn't there's a lot of shine that comes off with that and you also if you're someone like thomas harris who does seem quite competent and quite smart like like, the character is only a smart as the author and only as smart as the readers so if you don't think you can carry off a genius like somebody who's barely human somebody who's an analogous to satan maybe don't write that pov and i i discover that as an author all the time uh trying to write pov of someone particularly skilled in an area i am not let alone smarter than me is oh boy it's an uphill battle there's so it's such an interesting acknowledgement of like the the power that those characters have when you keep your distance from them but it's also about having respect for or the rest of the world that is in these stories because Red Dragon would not be what it is without Will Graham. And Clarice Starling is clearly like next to Hannibal, the most important character in this franchise. Silence of the Lambs would be a really shitty book if it were like a Holmes and Watson kind of dynamic with Clarice playing sl- second fiddle to <laughs> Hannibal Lecter. Like it has to, you have to give the other character center stage and then have this other character be there to push things forward. Yeah, he's a, he's an unlikely ally. And I like that. Like, he's challenging, but he's also, if you can solve his riddles or whatever, he'll help you for a price. And I like that. I like that dynamic. And I think that taking him so far out of where we knew him, you know, behind bars as this mysterious figure, uh, as somebody who couldn't cause a lot of direct harm, like, obviously, he did manage to get Migs killed, and he almost killed Will Graham's family. But like, he couldn't physically for a long time actually harm somebody. And we didn't actually see him eating people. So to go from that to like, and then that scene where he sautés Paul Krenler's fucking brain is a little weird. (laughs) <laughs> you know, some people really liked that and I didn't mind it. But I-, I feel like the things that we liked about Lecter were not as fleshed out as what we got. There's one more thing, too, that this made me think of. And that's that. Uh, sorry, we've entered into the realm where I actually have like a modicum <laughs> of things to say and experience with the topic. It just made me think as a writer, I so often find that if I'm writing in one character's POV, I'm really more writing about the other characters. Yes. Um, it is much, much easier to write things that are precise about a character whose POV you aren't in. Because the POV you are in is the workhorse. It has to carry you through every scene and every moment. And it's actually really hard. Obviously, there's lots of character that goes into that, but that kind of has to be your utility character a lot of the times. Like, they've got to just get the job done. It's really hard to have that character be the, like, florid magic satan dude with glowing eyes because you can't have him stop and look at his own glowing maroon eyes in the mirror and remark what a strange spectral like horror he is like by necessity when you're in someone's pov it invites you to understand them and it also invites you to make that it makes them more normal and so you lose this quality that hannibal lecter has when you 
sit in his head constantly because he can't he can't be that weird he's navigating he's through the world the way a narrator has to yeah he's still going grocery shopping at the end of the day we understand that on a fundamental level and aside from the fact that he's a cannibal like who wants to see Hannibal Lecter grocery shop that's a very human mundane thing to see for whatever reason Thomas Harris didn't write him as an inscrutable POV he did not write him as someone that Mm -hmm. was terribly difficult to follow along with that you had to do complex deep reads of his POV he wrote him as pretty understandable. I feel like we've kind of done a broad overview of this very good and very disappointing series. <laughs> and how I really do think that one of the reasons why the first two work are because Hannibal is not a main character and also because he wrote such compelling main characters. Like, Will Graham is a cool dude. And because, like I said, Will Graham being the genius torture detective with empathy too close to his work wasn't as much of a cliche as it is now. He was the originator. He was the first one. And now we've got everybody on fucking mm-hmm. CSI just being like, I can't look, I'll turn into a monster. Um, <laughs> So that was interesting, and he was a, a well-written character, and, and you know he had a fairly tragic end, so that was compelling. And then we had Clarice, who is my wife, and I love her, and she's just, she's just so resilient up until she isn't. And I don't know, man, I, I have a lot of feelings about this series, and I have for a very long time. Yeah, I don't think anyone could doubt that about you. <laughs> Clarice Starling will not be brainwashed. <laughs> <laughs> into putting wine on her nipple god damn it do you do you hear me thomas <laughs> i have a letter from him that I, I i wrote him in like i don't know 2001 and he wrote me back in his lovely copper plate handwriting and he said very sweet things and he's a lovely man but i want to write that address back and be like listen hey i'm a grown-up now and i know this is this is bullshit i realized i was a hardcore hannibal clarice shipper and that really colored everything that i did <laughs> <laughs> and arguably, I'm a hardcore Hannibal Will Cram shipper, but that has nothing to do with your work at all. <laughs> at all, even a little. That's between me and Moss Mickelson and you dancing and God. <laughs> that's between me and Brian fucking Fuller. I'm coming for him. Yeah. God damn it. Anyway, yeah, that's another episode. I want to write him and just be like, hey, are there things you would change? <laughs> <laughs> Loaded question. <laughs> How do you feel now about... Nipples and wine and your sins. <laughs> how do you feel about your sins? Confess to me, Thomas Harris. Oh, how do you feel about that weird subplot with Margot and her wife trying to get pregnant, huh? How do you feel about the Barney thing? How do you feel about Mason Verger as a character? How do you feel about Jane Gum as a character? Would you change these things? Looks directly into Thomas Harris's eyes with the fiery intensity of a thousand burning suns. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda, for taking me on this journey. I took you to Lurch, Lecter Church. Lurch! Thanks for taking me to Lurch. Uh, I guess we can do the outro now. Do we want to tease what's coming up in, in weeks coming? Yeah, I, I think because as always, we're flying by the seat of our pants. We haven't determined the exact episode order yet. But I can tell you that uh, a couple things that will be coming up in the pipeline are an episode on magic systems and the building of different magic systems, uh, mainly focusing on Diana Wynne Jones and Jonathan Stroud. That's going to be one for me. And then uh, another one that I'm going to do is on um, big, sprawling, book long metaphors <laughs> featuring the Book of Salt by Monique Trong, which is one of my favorite favorite books you do love it nobody you do read. love it and no one has read it i want to do something on killing eve i want to do something on the book and i guess adaptation the changeover by margaret mahi because it's my favorite ya book obviously i'm probably eventually going to come back to the lector universe and talk about things that aren't the books And I just really hope you all are enjoying these deep dives into media that we enjoy and also hate and if you want to talk to amanda about hannibal literally anytime I'm here she's here for you <laughs> also, I realized I didn't mention it in the first podcast, but if you uh, like the show and you would like to support our works, wish my voice hadn't cracked, but I'm going to go along with this take anyway. We have a Patreon. We do. I will um, link it. And if you happen to want to toss us a couple dollars a month, if you happen to spare it, to be able to spare it, oh goodness. <laughs> Please, sir. If you a could. Hot penny. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Penny. Yeah, anyway, we super, super appreciate our patrons. Um, they help make this show possible. They do. And they help just encourage us in general. And we've got some fun perks on there. And uh, you can check that out at the link, at the link which Amanda will place in the description. I believe you can find us, uh, I think it, we're just like patreon.com slash gene chant, but also I'll link it in the show notes. 
And if you want to talk to me on Twitter, um, well, first, if you want to talk to the Red Pen Twitter, I guess, we are on Twitter at at Red Pen Pod. We are on Facebook as the Red Pen. I have an individual Twitter at Amanda H, as in Hannibal. Gene, you are on Twitter. <laughs> at Austin Chanted. Yes. And that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, if you love something, cut it up.